When we got on the land at Flock, we started taking a cursory look through our forests, and it was in the fall of 2022 when we finally noticed the dreaded hemlock woolly adelgid, a xylem-sucking invasive mealybug that has been taking out our iconic hemlock forests up and down the East Coast. Hemlocks, as we'll find out, are irreplaceable trees, which are vital to the integrity of the ecosystems that they inhabit. Because of their significance and unique niche, they are considered keystone species. Not knowing what strategies are available to landowners to control the adelgid, we took to the scientific literature, countless Zoom calls with extension officers, and brought in Mark Whitmore, the director of the New York State Hemlock Initiative and senior extension associate at Cornell University, and Matt Gallo, the terrestrial invasive species coordinator at Finger Lakes Prism, to share their experience, knowledge, and advice when it comes to the adelgid. My hope with this video is to give landowners and public land officials a greater understanding of the adelgid, its impact, and the current control measures out there, since it was not easy as a landowner to get clear and actionable advice on the topic. I'm the Terrestrial Invasive Species Coordinator for the Finger Lakes Partnership for Regional Invasive Species Management. And okay. so I'm the Terrestrial Invasive Species Coordinator, so I'm doing everything that is on land. Um, but that's a large swath of organisms. Yes. Like that you have to, you yes. have to be kind of expert-ish, at least on a lot of- A lot of different things. Yeah. Our job is a little bit easier here in New York because um, our, most of our invasive species are really just like plants and insects. Uh -huh. You know, we have, I was at the National Invasive Species Conference down in Florida um, in November, and yeah. they were talking about, you know, having to trap like Burmese pythons, and, like monitor <laughs> lizards, like, like, you know, like yeah, it's just like all this crazy stuff. Yeah. Like, thank God, wild I don't, boar, like yeah, you know, it's like okay, no, wild stuff. Like, <laughs> yeah. I just have to worry about like bugs and plants. Like, that's really <laughs> nice. <laughs> um, yeah, and so one of those uh, species that we tend to put a lot of our focus on is, is HWA, Hemlock mm -hmm. woolly In terms of like how we kind of fell into this, I mean mm -hmm. really invasive species and non-native species in general are like, it's like a big spectrum mm -hmm. of, of sort of like damage and impacts and changes to our environment, right? Some non-native species don't really cause a lot of problems. Some of them actually adapt, you know, really quite well into, mm -hmm. into the new environments they're introduced to. Some of them are really, really bad, right? Yeah. And are, you know, really only having negative impacts. And, and HWA is one of those. And mm. you know, if you had the list, you know, top five, top ten invasive species in New York. Um, in terms of like destructive potential, I mean, mm -hmm. HWA has got to be towards the top of that list. Really? Okay. Yeah, they... So when did you start to concentrate on HWA in PRISM? Yeah, so we only started this just like a couple years ago. Oh, and um, it, but it's been here for a while, right? It started to move up. Yeah, that's a really interesting sort yeah. of like how HWA was able to move around. It's mm -hmm. been downstate for quite a while. A long time, mm. uh, but upstate really only started moving in here like the last like 10, 15 years right. or so. Right, as a, as the winter started to warm and yeah. everything like that. Yeah, yeah. they, they yeah. typically don't do well with like really cold temperatures. Right, and so we have some here, but are, yeah. these, these are the egg sacs. Can you tell me a bit more about like what their life cycle is like? Yeah, oh, yeah that's a that's a huge question. Yeah. So the HWA life cycle is is super complicated. Yeah, we call it the hemlock woolly adelgid, mm -hmm. but they're really this is their secondary hosts. Hemlock trees. Oh, really? Yes, they um, their primary oh, host. Tell. And see, <laughs> so the primary host of HWA, which is um, the definition of like a primary host in like insect pests, is mm. where sexual reproduction takes place. Mm. It's actually on a very specific tree called tiger tail spruce in Japan, where we got our HWA originally from. Are you saying they cannot produce sexually? They cannot produce sexually on hemlock trees. Really? Yeah, they, so they it's literally just can't. Only asexual. It's only asexual reproduction that's happening here. And, and um, none of our Piceas can add as no, wow. no, they are so very, it's very specific of that specific yes. Picea to do sexual reproduction. So we will never see, potentially, never see sexual reproduction here, and only asexual reproduction. Yes. And explain what asexual reproduction is for folks. Yeah. So asex asexual reproduction is essentially um, being able to reproduce through one individual. That's um, in this case which just is crazy. Which is crazy. It's so it's like the Virgin Mary, but the Virgin. Hemlock will be <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, pretty much, yeah. So with HWA, um, 
they can reproduce through a process called parthenogenesis. Mm -hmm. And parthenogenesis is a female can lay an unfertilized egg that will hatch to a, an exact clone of herself. Mm -hmm. So what we have here in North America are all of these adelgids are basically clones of each other. And what that means is, is that here in North America, unlike in its native range, I mean, HWA is an all-female species. They're all mm -hmm. just clones of each other. And that creates some unfortunate realities of our HWA population because they're not reproducing sexually. That means you only need you know, one female, yeah. strong gusts of winds, maybe like a yeah. bird lands in this hemlock and like picks up an adelgid somehow. And that one female can be transported, you know, 10, 20, yeah. 100 miles away. And she could start a whole population by herself. It's crazy. Pretty much right. As long as she's able to survive and get to a hemlock and, yeah. and reproduce. So like, let me good. ask you this, because it's only asexual reproduction and they're clones of one another, correct? They're clones. Yes. How, how, how is there any kind of like genetic differentiation? Like, you know, we were just chatting uh, with Mark and he was, yeah. he was mentioning that, you know, one that might be a little bit cold hardier than the others, but if you're a clone, you're the same as the other. How do, can you yeah. have any genetic deviation at all from an asexual reproduction? Asexual yeah, so reproduction? you can, and that's a little bit outside of my area of expertise yeah. to kind of like answer that question. Um, I don't know how it happens, but yeah. like somehow they are able to um, get some Differentiation. Some somehow. little <laughs> levels of like differentiation. Yeah. I don't think it's much. Yeah. But I know I have like seen studies that have shown, yeah, that like the ones in like New York are yeah. like slightly more cold hardy than the ones that they find like down in like Virginia. That's like for instance. So I don't know how it happens. Yeah. It kind of boggles my mind, yeah. but like you know, life finds a way, man. It's just how yeah. it works. Yeah. I mean so <laughs> I mean there's so much we don't know. I mean, let's yeah. be honest. So you know, these are all females. You could say, okay, and these are all the eggs. And if they all hatch, they're all going to be clonal females of the one, you know, adelgid yeah. or the several adelgid. Well, how many adelgid that are uh, put on here? There's two generations in here. So we kind of mm -hmm. talked about that first generation. It's called the Sissons generation. They're active from, they're kind of born actually like around now. Mm -hmm. You know, they'll, they'll grow up for a little bit. They'll become the crawlers. They, they acivate throughout the summer and then they come back out and again in the winter. They feed, they do their thing. Now, right now, you know, we're filming this you know, early April. Mm -hmm. We are right at the point where we're transitioning to that second generation. This is usually where like the sexual reproduction would be taking place. So this is where the life cycle gets kind of weird. But they're, we're moving into the second generation is called the progredians generation. Um, so, so all the adults now, like they're kind of dying off and the egg masses that we have now, mm -hmm. those are the egg masses for the second generation is gonna be feeding on um, these trees throughout. April, May, June, and July, and they're gonna lay the eggs for the adelgid stage that's gonna acivate throughout the summer. So I this see. is a much shorter generation okay. in time, but it's these two generations is what makes um, like the biocontrol just so hard. I was gonna say, when do you, when's the best time to release the biocontrol? Exactly, because you yeah. Could release it at a time when they're, would they be affected by the, during the acivation, that's when you wouldn't release them? Yeah, it's when like you wouldn't be releasing yeah. them and then like, you know, if you have an insect that, you know, like a like a predator that can last like throughout the winter, well then, you know, is it going to be able to go through this kind of like brief period in time where there's not as much food to eat? Yeah. Is that going to match up with the predator's life cycle, you know, where they're going to be spending time yeah. developing and moving on to their next generation? Mm -hmm. That's why there has to be two biocontrols because you mm -hmm. need one to feed on each generation. It's of interesting. It. Yeah. Okay. Uh, you know, these are the fuzzy egg sacs, correct? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Can you even see the adult? So HWA, in terms of like its size, mm -hmm. adult adelgids are about the width of a human hair, like at full, full size. Oh. And the width of a human hair is actually like right around the size mm -hmm. where the human eye like can't really detect more detail than that. Mm -hmm. Like that's where our eyes are kind of like, it's just way too small for me. Yeah. So. And it's, we're really looking at like the limits of like what the human eye is capable of detecting. Now, if you have like right. a magnifying glass, you know, you knew like where to look, you could like find the little guys. But really, you know, they're so hard to find anyways that we're, it, it's the egg masses that, that we're gonna be looking for. So when you do any kind of collection or monitoring on site, yeah. are you looking for the adults or are you just kind of looking? No, for we're just masses? looking for the egg masses. Okay. Um, okay. Because again, like looking for the adults and, and this is the problem, this is a really big problem with their, with their life cycle is yeah. that you miss one female, you know, and you could come back next year and not tree, or you know, maybe not next year, but maybe like a few years later yeah. on. And if you miss a single female, well then 
you essentially miss the population, at what, least. One of the other things that I thought was very interesting too is when I first heard about hemlock woolly adelgid, everyone's like, oh, it was brought over from Asia. Yeah. And it was it came on off, off a you know, Japanese suga and all this other kind of stuff. What I didn't realize until probably a few weeks ago is that we also have hemlock woolly adelgid. Maybe it's a different kind of subspecies or whatever out in the west of, oh, the, yeah. of the United States. And I was like, well, that's interesting. And that's where some of that biocontrol had come from. Yes. And so, you know, the trees out there had really developed sort of like resistance yes. to it. And, you know, here we don't have, we had never had any kind of hemlock yeah. adelgid. So it makes sense that the Suga canadensis and the Suga caroliniana didn't have any type of resistance or pests yeah. associated with yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, and so we don't have any like native adelgids here mm -hmm. um, to f to fight uh, naturally feed on um, HWA, and so we don't. Our hemlocks just don't know like what to do. They don't know yeah. how to respond to this. You know, the the eastern and Carolina hemlocks are sort of like the black sheep's of like the hemlock worlds because if you look at like you know, like the global range mm -hmm. of where all the hemlock species are. They, they basically kind of like circle around like the Pacific Ocean. Like there's a bunch of species over in Asia. And then we have our friends, you know, the mountain and Western hemlocks on the West Coast. Mm -hmm. um, and then there's a big gap, right? Yeah. Like over North America. And then you find, you know, these guys, right? Yeah. Like the Eastern and, and Carolina hemlocks. And so they're very genetically distinct, like compared to, to those other hemlock yeah, species. Yeah, they seem to have really diverged yeah. from the clade. And I was even reading that the Suga canensis can't, you can't even hybridize it with, yeah. you know, the uh, the the suga canadensis. Yeah, so they're definitely like they they are kind of like off in their own little worlds, yeah. like our hemlocks over here. Yeah, which I think is all the more reason why we need to do something. Yeah, because it, it, the the hemlocks in the West have had hemlock woolly adelgid. They grew up with it essentially, yeah, and much. they have a pest that you know, go against the hemlock woolly adelgid. We don't have that. And, yeah. th and this is our this is our only solution. The idea that they never sexually reproduce is mind boggling. Yeah, I just it's did crazy. not know that. Yeah, and so they actually um they'll grow wings too. Yeah. Um these the ones that reproduce they sexually don't grow any wings. Um they pretty much like stay attached so to where they are. When you're saying that a bird picks it up and then takes it to the nut that's kind of how they might that's be or how wind gusts or something. Yeah, a lot of it um and a lot of it's really due to winds. Like mm -hmm. um like they just found um HW in the Adirondacks for the first time like around Lake George. Mm -hmm. And if you look at like how that population is is spreading, it's like going in like a diagonal line just like straight across and even though it's like affecting all the hemlocks that are kind of in that path but there's it's going along the line but there's hemlocks on like either side yeah of that infestation but they're not getting there it just be literally because the wind is not taking them there like this huh. is a species where like literally they just go where the wind takes them we're only seeing obviously these low lower branches yeah. and we could see that there is hemlock woolly adelgid on these lower branches i can't obviously get all high high up but how do they do you have a sense of where they put their eggs? Is it only on the lower branches? Is it all the way up there? Yeah, so it's just gonna kind of come down to like wherever they land, <laughs> right? Like, I see. and these guys are little crawlers. They don't have wings. They're not really mobile. Like, you know, what might be like a long like distance to run or walk mm -hmm. to me and you, like the distance of like a twig, like a few inches is mm -hmm. like gonna be that distance to them. Yes, because the way you said a crawler. So for people who don't understand, once they hatch out of their egg, yep they have this crawler stage yes. and that's the only time that they're able to be mobile yeah. with their legs. Yes. And then what happens when they become an adult? Yeah, so, so two things will happen here. Um, and this is where like the HWA life cycle gets just like really, really weird because there's two generations in a year. Mm -hmm. And so if we're talking about like the summer generation, they all kind of crawl around, they'll find like a good spot, to settle down. Like, oh, this is like a nice, nice spot where I'm gonna nice get some- Nice juicy bit. Nice juicy <laughs> bit like right yeah. over here. Yeah. They'll sit down and they'll go through a period at what's called acetivation, mm -hmm. uh, which is basically summer hibernation. And the reason why, you know, we're out here and, you know, the beginning of April, and mm -hmm. usually we're looking for HWA, you know, in like January and February mm -hmm. for, for these guys is because um, that's when the sap is flowing most in hemlock trees, mm -hmm. right? Same reason we're tapping sugar maples this time of year. Mm -hmm. um, same reason these guys are tapping their hemlock trees this mm -hmm. time of year. So during the summer and during the fall, you know, when sap's going the other way, it's going back down towards the roots, um, they'll just kind of shut down and they'll just hang out there and they'll go through that acetivation period. Now, once you get um, into you know, colder temperatures, sap starts flowing back the other way, um, that's when the adelgids um, kind of reactivate and they'll start feeding. Mm -hmm. um, and they'll go through um, some sort of nymph stages, they'll, they'll kind of grow larger and larger and larger. Um, they sort of become like a, more attached to the um, 
actual hemlock twig that they're on. Um, so in a lot of cases, you know, they like lose their legs. Um, they like com pretty much completely like absorb themselves like to the tree. Fascinating. Um, feeding on them. Yeah. Um, and, and they don't move after that. No, they're not moving. Yeah. They're, they found their spot. I mean, this yeah. is it. This is this is the, the peak of the mountain, you know, yeah. like <laughs> life's fulfillment. <laughs> now, if you're looking for like other signs of, of HWA, um, this is where kind of like the biology of the hemlock tree is really helpful because hemlocks um, actually cast the most amount of shade of any tree that's native to New York State. Hmm. And so what, what you should be expecting when you're underneath a hemlock tree is a really like thick, dense canopy, lots of needles. Mm -hmm. um, they're blocking out a lot of sunlight. They're not gonna, obviously it's not gonna block out all the sunlight, right. but it should be blocking out a lot of sunlight. When you look at, you know, maybe some like other hemlock trees mm -hmm. that- We have some more over there too. Yeah, maybe you're like losing some of their needles. I don't know if they're losing some of their, like sometimes I see if something's being lost, it, they almost look like skeletons, like brown skeletons. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I have not seen that in these trees yet, which is what <laughs> made me hopeful, but maybe you could see something that I don't. Yeah, you know? so these, I mean, these trees don't look too bad, but you know, usually when we're looking at, if you can't actually see the egg masses that the tree is way too tall, yeah. you'll start to see, you know, some of the needles maybe turning like gray, maybe turning yellow. Uh -huh. It'll start losing a lot of that canopy cover. And if you start to see like trees that, you know, like the branches look a little bit too bare. Right. Right, you start to see like a lot of like sunlight getting through, not a, um, like more and more gaps in the canopy. That's like a really good sign that you have some decline. Now it's important to distinguish like, Hemlocks, like all conifers, they'll shed like their needles on the lower branches. Right, because like, they're not getting any light. Yeah, they're not getting any light. So yeah. like, if you see like some dead branches, especially towards the bottom, like that's really nothing to be concerned about. It's when you start seeing it taking place like throughout the canopy. And this right. tree kind of has some signs of that where, you know, it looks like pretty sparse in some areas. And um, then also I would say like, you know, in June, uh, Mark was saying you start to see new growth on the trees. Yeah. And then if you're not seeing that new yes. growth, then that's another sign that there might be some activity of hemlock. Yeah, absolutely. And so they love actually to kind of fester around where new growth is gonna be. They yeah. really prefer like the edges of those twigs. I think anybody with like indoor house plants who have had a mealybug infestation will totally understand yeah. that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Because <laughs> it's very, it's similar. I mean, they like to, the new growth tips are the most tasty bits. Yeah, you know? exactly. So, um, especially if you're not seeing like new growth um, in the summer, yeah. that's like a very clear sign that you probably have HWA. Which is really the time when they start putting out their growth because they're shade tolerant, right? Yeah. But we don't have any leaves on the on the trees yet. Yeah. And that's when they can get their light. Yeah. Is actually exactly. now before like all the deciduous trees leaf out. Yeah. So in June, like a couple months from now, we're gonna have to be looking out here and seeing if there's like new growth at all. Yeah. But can you actually replace this tree? I mean, I can't think of another one that could be replaceable. Yeah, that's that's a big problem with hemlocks is like, yeah, you know, Emerald ash borer was really bad. It was really sad to lose all of our ash trees. And, and this is in no way to diminish the importance that ash plays in the landscape, mm -hmm. but you know, Ash doesn't really do anything that like other trees don't already do, right? Like doesn't do anything that like elms don't already do or maples don't already do. Hemlocks, that's a different story, right? Like there's no trees that are really like hemlocks. They're considered a keystone species here in New York. Mm. Um, you know, hemlocks are, a, when we're thinking about conifers in New York City, right? we have pines, we have spruces, we have firs. Yeah. What do all those trees have in common? Well, they're all like open sun species. They're very shade intolerant mm -hmm. species, right? And hemlocks are not like that. Hemlocks are very shade tolerant. Again, like we said before, they're the, they cast the most amount of shade of any tree. They yeah. love growing um, in, in really like deep woods and they're a climax species, right? So they're not growing up with, with the oaks or um, you know, ash or pines or things like that. They're growing up you know, with maples. They're growing mm -hmm. up with, with beech and birch and those sorts of trees. Mm -hmm. um, and so you know, they're playing a role that, that's just, just so unique. So really it's, it's the shade that they cast um, plays um, probably the biggest role of anything that they do because they're casting so much shade and you're you're getting maybe like a taste of it yeah. in the woods over here. But yeah. like you go to like a really big hemlock forest, right? Where it's like all hemlock trees. You really notice that difference, of like yeah. all the shade they're casting, especially like and on a hot summer cooler. day. It's yeah. much cooler. It's much cooler and the shade on the floor is much cooler as well, yeah. you know? Yes. Uh, and, and also when I think of hemlocks, I think of like 
wet forest. Yes, exactly, right? Yeah. So not only are they lowering the temperature, but because they're blocking out so much sunlight, there's really, the water's not evaporating too much. Um, and so you get like a lot more of these like swampy conditions. Mm -hmm. Oftentimes when you have hemlocks growing along like stream sides, lower temperatures will increase the capacity of water to hold oxygen. Exactly, and then you get better species richness and yes. diversity in those streams, which is healthier for the stream. Exactly, and a lot of organisms are really depending on, on those sorts of conditions that hemlocks are creating, mm -hmm. especially like brook trout, right? Like brook trout are state fish. You know, they're, they're doing okay, but maybe they're not doing as well as they could be, and they really tend to thrive in streams that run through hemlock forests. because the, the exact sorts of conditions that, that they really thrive on. And I think most people probably are like, what, insects and water? But we have a lot of insects, dragonflies, damselflies, stoneflies, mayflies, you know, uh, tapulidae, like, you know, craneflies. Yeah. All these things are actually have an aquatic life stage and then they become adults and then they fly out of the, the, the water. You know, they come up and cr climb up on a typha or some type of, you know, uh, emergent re vegetation and then they turn into their adult life cycle. So a lot of these insects that in other small fish and other fish that eat are vital in the stream. Yeah. And I, when I grew up in Pennsylvania, and this is our state tree, Sura yeah. canadensis, I always looked at it as a riparian tree, like yeah, something exactly. along our streams. Like there wasn't any other tree that was so closely linked to our stream ecosystems. Yeah, exactly. Um, and there's even, you know, getting out of the water, um, there's so many other organisms, you know, besides just animals that rely on, on hemlock trees. Um, are you familiar with uh, Ganoderma or Rishi mushrooms? Yeah, the Rishi mushrooms. Yeah, yeah. so there's, there's two species. There's one over in Asia um, that's more of a generalist, but we have it here in North America too, Ganoderma suge, and they are obligate hemlock species. Hmm. They're really not common, and they you really only find them in like pure hemlock stands because they could hmm. only grow on hemlock wood. Hmm. Now you know, these mushrooms are super cool, right? They're yeah. they're beautiful. They got that red, orange, yellow color to Popular them. Popular medicinal, yeah. Popular medicinal. It looks like it's a polished, like a literally a polished mushroom with that yeah. red orange color. Yeah. yeah, and so when we're talking about you know like losing hemlocks. You know, we're not, we're, it's not even just losing, you know, the brook trout mm -hmm. or all of the, um, you know, really important insects that we have. You know, talking about losing these, these mushrooms too, right? Yeah. And, and they're just like you said, like they're medicinal. And, you know, in, in China, they're known as, you know, mushrooms of immortality, mm -hmm. right? They, they can increase, um, you know, immune health, heart health, lung health. Um, they could have been, sh been shown to... Um, reduce the risk of tumors growing. And so, mm -hmm. you know, who knows like what, what medical benefits we're potentially losing by yeah. losing hemlocks too. Yeah. And there's a human dimension, right? That like, that doesn't like get talked about enough. Right. Um, but I feel like it's really important for us to mention. Well, you know, it's one of those things where once you are losing something, that's when, you know, that's when the obituaries come out. You know, <laughs> this is like, this is what this tree was known for after yeah. all those times. And you, you don't realize what you're losing until it starts to go. Yeah. And so I think that's what we're realizing with hemlock. So yeah, thank you so much for sharing a bit more about like how this, the importance of this tree, because I'm sure we could, you know, rattle off another like <laughs> six reasons of why, yeah. you know, you should be doing something about your hemlocks. If you're not looking for it, you're not gonna really see it usually. Well, we did look for it when we first got here and didn't see it. So I'm wondering if yeah, this just happened there. within the last year or so. Well, there it is. Yeah, the egg sacs. No, I'm not sure those are still alive. They might have been killed by the winter. Oh, really? They're not very, they're not very advanced. The hemlock woolly adelgid prefers the most recent year's growth. But when an infestation first gets going, it'll oftentimes infest one, two, maybe even three years of growth. Okay. And that's sort of what I'm looking for here. It looks like it's been here. These are all old ovisacs from uh, previous years. And uh, so this one, this one started in fall. Okay. And um, they, I was, they would be bigger right now if they had survived the winter. This is a pretty hard winter yeah. uh, for them. Here's a really good example oh, here. of them. Yeah. Um, and so this is on the last year's growth. 
And so they didn't survive, because wouldn't uh, they? Well, I don't know. Leave? You see, when, oh, when you yeah. squish them, you get that brown stuff. If they are alive, you'll get red. And so the really quick way to tell whether or not you have a, a living, a, a, a good, good living population is you just rub your hands like this, and uh -huh. if you get brown on your hands, uh, you got dead ones. And if really? you, you have red on your hands, you have live ones. That's a really scientific way of doing it. <laughs> uh, well, that's a very good in the field way of doing it, for yeah, sure. Yeah, <laughs> so there's, there's a lot of dead ones here. You've got a lot of mortality, but you know, the, the thing is, is they, they reproduce asexually, and all you need is one survivor, and you have the whole population developing right. over a short period of time. Right. And if cold tolerance is a genetically linked trait, then you have a whole population developing that's more cold tolerant. That's right, because then it survived the winter, and then it's reproducing yes. either with itself on its own or with another party. And Yes, so and we don't have the direct evidence, but anecdotally there's other adelgids, like the balsam lily adelgid. Yeah, because <coughs> this is not has, your first rodeo. Like, you, you were studying adelgids out west, weren't yes, you? Yes, yeah. yes, the balsam lily adelgid, and unfortunately here as well, and it's causing great problems right now in the Adirondacks, and I've even found it up to tree line almost on Mount Washington, and that's cold. But when I first started, way back before dinosaurs, the, I couldn't get money to work on it because everybody thought the balsam malia delgid would stay on the, near the uh, water okay. where it was warmer in Puget Sound area. Right, and then it expanded. And yeah. now, it's, now it's up in Yellowstone Park and Mount Washington. So yes, it's, it's cold tolerant. And, and it used to be with the hemlock woolly adelgid, people had the same opinion that it would really wouldn't get up into the Adirondacks because it's too cold there. Well, now we have it in the Adirondacks right. as well. Not this winter, but last winter, we had snows through May. I don't, like this winter, I thought was relatively mild, but we did have some really severely cold it was days that in between. one cold snap. Yeah. That was really, really bad. But and, you know, the interesting thing is that our research shows that it isn't the extreme cold of a winter, but it's when that cold arrives. Okay. And so right now, in April, if we were to get a really cold event, it would really be devastating to the population because right now is when they're beginning to pick up their development and they'll be laying eggs very soon. And so when, when, it, goes, when it gets to that stage, they're very vulnerable to the cold. Uh, so this could actually be, if we don't get another cold snap, this could be a very good year for them to... No, I think they already got hit pretty hard. Interesting, okay. So um, it... So there, I mean, this is pretty heavy, heavily infested. And I, I think if these were still alive, it would be, they'd be fatter right now. Well, uh, one of the other things that we notice, if just like kind of looking, because we have a, a conglomeration here of about maybe 36 hemlocks. They're not super old. Some of the older hemlocks are further down in the woods. Uh -huh. And I, we haven't really taken a look at those because their leaves are way far up there. You were saying that they had been here a few years. How long, if they actually start to become active, how long would these trees last? Because I haven't seen any dead limbs so far. That's, you know? uh, well, Okay, so it's really hard to say. I think that <clears throat> the health of the tree is, is crucial for its capacity to withstand infestation. Uh, if you have a healthy tree growing on good soils, it's gonna have the reserves to uh, continue to grow even though it's infested. What the hemlock woolly adelgid does is it puts its mouth parts into the twig tissue, into the xylem of the twig tissue. And so when it feeds, it actually stimulates the xylem to clog itself up. And so it isn't the needles that die first, it's the buds that die first. Mm. And so that's what I look at when I look at these trees. And you can see right up there, yeah. exactly. It's already killed buds. It's been here a while. Um, and uh, the best way to tell like the health of your tree is to look for the bright green shoots in which the we don't, time. Which we don't have any right now. It may be still early. <laughs> no, it's June is the best time to okay. look for those. And you can give a, get a really quick viewpoint of, of how healthy your trees are 
by looking at for those shoots in spring. And if you also, you know, yeah. the, it'll lose the, the buds on the lower part of the tree first. So you always got to look up into the upper parts of the right. tree. And that's especially important when you're using um, insecticides to try and save your tree, because oftentimes uh, the, the lower branches, they'll they, when they draw up the insecticide, it goes to the top of the tree first, and so the lower branches will still seem to be heavily impacted, but it's the top of the tree that's really responding. Right. Now, you mentioned pesticides, and I know that's really the almost the only option, at least here in New York, for people. And is it? But you're doing biocontrol on public yeah. lands, right? Yeah, well, we have public funding. Right, so and you have so public funding so you could do that on public lands. We have to do it on public lands. That's the that's the deal. So tell me about, like, the biocontrol that you're using on public lands. I mean, is it relatively a new st studies that you're doing, and how long have you been doing it? Uh, we've, been, we've been working on biological control in New York State since 2008. And uh, when we first got it up here in the Finger Lakes, it's been, they've been using it, they've been releasing since 2003 further south. In North Carolina is when the first releases were. But the, the researchers have traveled to Japan, to China, but the biocontrol agents, the insects that we use now, they came from the Pacific Northwest, mm -hmm. where the adelgid is present. In fact, that's where I grew up, and I didn't even learn about the hemlock woolly adelgid right. because it's not an issue. Right. And research has shown that, indeed, it's the predators that are most important in controlling the populations. And so we've taken the predators that are present there and brought them out here. There's three of them. Uh, there's a beetle, Laracobius nigrinus, and two silverfly species that we're using now. Okay. And and we've been releasing Laracobius nigrinus since uh, 2008, 2008, 2009. And uh, we first started working with uh, the silverflies in 2015, but really, in, uh, really starting to release significant numbers in 2017. So the thing about these predators and the hemlock woolly adelgid, as you saw here, I mean, there's like mm -hmm. how many adelgids in just one tree? Yeah. You know, there's thousands and thousands and it's just a numbers game really we release i think last year was one of our best years for releases and we only released 10,000 silver flies and you know 12,000 laracobius beetles and you're so, being able you're, you're able to like collect them again like the following year you find them that's so they well, yeah, yeah. I, that's i just got back from a collecting trip oh nice well so. i i actually have a question on the laracobus because you know, we have a native Laracobus out here that's Laracobius, sorry. L L Laracobius? Laracobius. Laracobius, yeah. Sorry, I don't mean... No, it's all good. <laughs> Correct me. <laughs> They're so hard to say. Yes, there's yeah. one Laracobius rubidus that yeah. feeds on the uh, uh, pine bark adelgid. And uh, it's, it's, we found it also on hemlock, feeding on hemlock woolly adelgid, but it's not very common. And it has interbred with Laracobius nigrinus, yeah. but... So far, the research indicates that it doesn't really breed to any, doesn't hybridize to any great degree. When we do genetic, there, there's a colleague of mine that does genetic work on populations of Laracobius, and they found that it sort of stabilizes at about 10% of the population. Okay, yeah, because I had read a report about the interbreeding, and I think mm -hmm. that these insects are probably so small, I can't imagine having to take them back into the lab and like try to identify like which one is which and which one's a hybrid. I imagine you have to do that. But I think I read one report that they were hybridizing and it seemed like the Laracobius rubidus, is yes. that the one, mm -hmm. was declining or at least from the, the samples that they took. And then my question there was like, well, if that is the case, if, you know, that's only one obviously like report, but if that is the case, would that then de-emphasize their success at being able to deal with the pine oh, adulthood. That's, that's a huge stretch. <laughs> <laughs> Is it? Okay. Yeah, I mean, because yeah. think about it. How many pine bark adelgids are there out there? I'm not sure. And, I never done, I've never done a survey. <laughs> there, there are quite a few. It's, yeah. it's everywhere. Yeah. And, and to take a small sample and then extrapolate to that point, I yeah. think, is irresponsible science. Okay. We don't know. We're, we're looking at it. I though. would say we're that not, could be a, it could be a good theory. <laughs> it's it's, it's a possibility, it. but I, you know, my, my gut instinct is that that won't happen. 
Interesting. That there's always, if there's a prey there and they have a predator present, it'll, it'll feed on them and they'll reproduce. It's not going to reduce, you're, you're assuming that it's going to reduce their fitness to prey on the populations, and I doubt that will happen. As Mark shared, research indicates that Laracobius nigrinus and Laracobius rubidus are hybridizing at a rate of around 10 to 15 percent. Additionally, a promising new species of Laracobius from Japan, discovered in 2005, known as Laracobius osakensis, seems to be similar to Laracobius nigrinus, but exhibits higher fecundity and higher predation rates on hemlock woolly adelgid. And unlike the Pacific Northwest native Laracobius nigrinus, the Japanese species Laracobius osakensis doesn't interbreed with our native Laracobius. This species was released from quarantine in 2010, and open releases started two years later, according to a report by the USDA. So there's another promising biocontrol agent in the queue, but it's uncertain when it will reach private landowners. The next set of questions I asked of Mark revolved around pesticide application and its effects specifically on non-target arthropod species. Now, I had read different literature on how the use, specifically of imidacloprid, a neonicotinoid, can have unattended effects on certain classes of arthropods. This, of course, also depends on how you apply the pesticide, so like directly into the tree or in a soil drench, for example, so that should be taken into consideration as well. Well, then let's talk about um, pesticides because right now, like I've, I've gone to like Zoom calls for hemlock woolly adelgid. I've been on like many, mm -hmm. I've chatted with a lot of folks and it just seems like really that's where everyone is pushing homeowners if you want to actually save your trees. There's So there's two pesticides. Mm -hmm. It seemed like from the, some of the reports, the imidacloprin does not uh, make an impact on spe species richness, but the amount of species get affected and afflicted, especially the uh, fungivorous insects and the phytophagus insects. And, and I don't know for how long. And I'm just wondering what are the cost benefit analysis for someone who is a homeowner who wants to think about this before applying, I, I'm you got me confused. I don't I don't understand what you're talking about. So, with the application of pesticides, I've read scientific literature. I could send I could give it to you before no, we no, leave. No, no, it's okay. Um, but that that you know, how does the pesticides affect the non-target insects? Non-target insects. Right. The the re research that I've seen shows that it's not affecting the diversity of species, but it affects the numbers of species of non-target insects, spe specifically ones that are fungivorous, like that eat fungi, or, or the ones that are phytophagous that are eating leaves. A second concern I brought up with Mark was the unattended effect that the insecticides may have on non-beneficial mite populations. Colin Orians, the director of environmental studies at Tufts University, mentioned how mites seem to explode on hemlock and non-target tree species after applications. So in addition to the hemlock woolly adelgid, there are a couple other insects slash arthropods that attack hemlock. Uh, one of them is the elongate hemlock scale. That is also a non-native species. And then the second player, besides the adelgid, is actually a native, and it's a spider mite, the spruce spider mite. And you can see webbing on the plant. And so here we have a plant that is uh, naive to two exotic insects, the scale and the adelgid. It's potentially attacked by a native. One of the things uh, that we learned recently is that um, if you want to control the adelgid, you can actually use chemical pesticides. And and so they use neonicotinoids, which are in the news, and they're thought to be um, quite problematic to pollinators and other things. So, but in some places where they're really trying to keep the hemlocks alive, they've put neonicotinoids on the plant, it gets taken up by the plant and kills the adelgid at the needles. But it turns out the native species that I was telling you about earlier, the, the mite, actually finds neonicotinoids to be kind of like candy. They actually do better. 
So the use of chemical pesticides to try to control the adelgid is actually not a good solution in the context of trying to sort of think about ways of saving our hemlocks because you're gonna create a different kind of problem and a native species can become a pest. The literature seems to support this, so it's something to take into consideration. Okay, it's very Here. simple. If you wanna save a hemlock tree, you have to use imidacloprid. Mm -hmm. There's just no other thing about it. And the important thing to realize is, yes, everything that feeds on a hemlock tree will probably be that, that he actually eats that tissue could be poisoned. But you won't have a hemlock tree for them to feed on if you don't treat it with the insecticide. So, you know, it's, it's sort of a, a, a damned if you do and damned if you don't situation. Right. Now, you know, it's like the impact on non-target organisms is actually quite minimal if they don't feed on the, the tree itself. And so, yes, hemlock looper, it'll impact hemlock loopers, but hemlock loopers won't have anything to eat if the hemlocks die. Mm. Um, I, it seems sort of trite, that answer, but, you know, it's really, um, you know, doing a cost-benefit analysis. I'm, I'm a biologist. I'm not an economist. Yeah. Uh, so to me, it's just, it's sort of dumb, actually. It's like, if you want your hemlock tree to live, you treat it. And it's sort of like, yes, it's going to impact other insects, but only the ones that feed on the tree. Um, and the, the, the application technique is not one of spraying the whole forest, which no. is what a lot of people yeah. think about. It's, it's more actually, injection. It's, the... it's actually treated directly onto the tree mm -hmm. itself or into the roots. Mm -hmm. taken, it's a systemic insecticide taken up into the tree, so it doesn't go all over the place. It stays right in that tree, in the tissues and it stays in the tree for about seven years, five to seven years maybe, the research shows. So it's, it's like, it's, it's one treatment, it's very, very rapid, and it maintains itself in the tree for a long period of time, and it's relatively inexpensive. Mm -hmm. And so it's sort of a miracle that we have that tool available to us to keep hemlock alive on the landscape so that their, their genes are actually there. You know, I don't know when the biological controls are going to actually take place or are going to be sufficient enough to maintain hemlock across the landscape in a healthy state. But in the meantime, at least we have the hemlocks present and right. those genes are not going away, which is what's happened in many places. You go down to the Great Smoky Mountain National Park right now and the only tree, hemlock trees that are alive are the ones that have been treated with insecticide. To clarify further, according to the National Park Service in the Great Smoky Mountains, foresters are proactively using three methods to control HWA. Soil drenching and stem injecting with insecticide, spraying the canopy, and the release of four biocontrol agents, including Laracobius nigrinus, Laracobius osakensis, Sasagi skimnus suga, and skimnus coniferarum. They found that beetles do become established and help the trees, but it's a longer-term strategy. Chemical treatments work well in controlling the adelgid to prevent sudden loss of trees, and foliar treatments are effective, but short-lived. And trees that were treated proactively have high survival rates. And those are huge. Some of those trees, hundreds of years old. And to have those genes on the landscape for the future of the hemlock forests is critical. It's a long-term strategy. The thing about pesticides, however, is even if you wanted to apply them, you can't do it yourself. You have to find a professional applicator who is equipped at doing that style of application. And you'll hear my frustration here. When I started to look and see that we had this on our trees, um, I you know, started doing the Zoom calls with hemlock, Willie Adelgid and all that kind of mm -hmm. stuff. But I have not been able to find any pesticide applicators. And I've asked everybody who I thought I could find yeah, you know, for this area. And it's I think tough. it's tough. And I think what's struggling for somebody who wants to do something about it, and I'm like somebody who's extremely proactive and, and mm -hmm. I, I wanna show people that there are solutions and options, but um, it's for somebody who's really proactive and still hits a lot of walls to actually be able to do something, it's very frustrating. So I can't imagine somebody who it cares but doesn't care enough, and then if they just hit a wall, they're just going to say, I give up. 
I'm generally pesticide hesitant, had trouble finding professional designated applicators, and fortuitously had a couple folks reach out to us on a secondary biocontrol they were using for which was available from tree savers near the town in Pennsylvania that I grew up in. Now this is an older biocontrol agent called Sasagi skimnasuga, which has shown up extensively in the literature, but Mark commented has fallen out of favor for various reasons, particularly around questions of whether it effectively establishes on or near release sites. There are conflicting reports in the literature on this, but those that have reached out to us anecdotally shared that it works for them. So Sasagi skimnasuga is still being used across various states and is available during certain times of the year to homeowners, though it's definitely pricey. Given that we didn't see many other options, we placed an order for Sasagi skimnasuga in the hopes that it'll establish and work on our trees. What's different about the way that Sasagi skimnasuga works, from what I understand, is that its young and its adults will feed on all stages of the adelgid, but the adults will feed in a separate area of the tree compared to their larva. So I actually reached out to other states, and some people reached out to me about some of the success that they're having on their land um, in like Pennsylvania, Connecticut, and Massachusetts, actually. And I'd love to get your view on this because they started to release uh, Sasagi skimnasuga, and they have been having really good responses from that. And oh, really, have yeah, you seen the research? I have seen actually the the early research didn't have any very good response back because I think what was the issue was a lot of the misunderstanding of the dissemination and the collection of the ability to be able to collect, partly from where you were able to collect them in the trees and also the seasonality. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. When they found that, okay, maybe fall is not the best time to actually collect, when they started to understand how they actually lay their eggs and where the adults go compared to where the young are, mm -hmm. then the collection rates within the last 10 years have been much more productive and more of the researchers are finding them on the trees, mainly within the last 10 to 12 years. Usually prior to mm -hmm. 2010, it was a little bit more like sketchy. So hmm. I will let you know <laughs> that we're gonna try to attempt it on the, these trees. Good luck. So, yeah, he <laughs> like he's like saying good luck. So what research? There's no research that I've seen that has actually proven that society skinness actually stays on the landscape and has an impact on M. Alcoolia delgid. Period. Now, Dr. Carol Che of the Valley Laboratory at the Connecticut Agricultural Experiment Station has employed biocontrol in Connecticut exclusively with mass releases of Sasagi skimnus suga since 1995. As of 2018, around 180,000 beetles have been released at 35 sites throughout Connecticut since 1995, including state, town, private forests, and on tribal land. Assessments in Connecticut release sites showed that Sasagi skimnasuga had reproduced and overwintered successfully, and field release sites are being revisited and reassessed 12 to 20 years after the release, funded by the USDA National Institute of Food and Agriculture. I connected with Carol in between her field checks, and she shared with me that they have thriving hemlocks as a result of the release of Sasagi skimnasugi, contrary to some out-of-state comments. I also spoke with her colleague, Dr. Gail Ridge, entomologist at the Connecticut Agricultural Experiment Station. She shared that if folks have small amounts of hemlock trees, one of the best and most cost-effective methods is to spray the trees with a high-powered horticultural spray in the months of October and November. This won't harm non-target insects and will knock back the hemlock woolly adelgid the following year. The high-powered horticultural oil option was also corroborated by our forester friend, Michael DeMunn, who used that method on Fraser fir in the Great Smoky Mountains National Park. Gail shared that if you have extremely tall trees, horticultural oil won't suffice, and you may have to resort to the use of targeted imidacloprid with a licensed applicator. I had a good conversation with James Rusty Rhea, entomologist of the Forest Health Protection in the Asheville, North Carolina field office of the USDA, and they reared several million of Sasagi skimnasuge early on to take a proactive approach as HWA moved through North Carolina. 
He shared that, I don't doubt that they are out there, but they aren't regularly seeing them on the trees, and they didn't seem to be helping tree health. He shared that they are seeing Laracobius, both Osakensis and Negrinus, and they are looking into silver flies now too. Currently, they are doing a combination of chemical control and biocontrol. Chemical control is not a good long-term control, though, he shared, and they are looking for a biocontrol package, which is the ultimate goal. He recommended that homeowners look into insecticide options, which may range from around 2 to $3 per inch of diameter for a targeted basal soil injection and 6 to $7 per inch of diameter for a stem injection. We'll be reaching out to see if we could find a pesticide applicator to focus on injection on some of our trees so we could do some comparisons and report back on results in the future. I, I know all the papers, all yeah. everything's been written, but there's been nothing that's been definitively demonstrated that society skimness has an impact on adelgid populations across the landscape. Hmm. They can show that it's become established maybe one or two generations, yeah. but that's it. It's, there are very few places that it actually persists. So, yeah. Well, that's really I would interesting. Not, I would not recommend its release here just based on that information. The, hmm. All the researchers now, I mean, basically have stopped using this insect. It was used in the south, um, and it has become established, but the numbers are very, very low hmm. compared to the numbers of Lyricobius nigrinus which we go to places that it's been released and it, we find it many miles away from the release points and we collect thousands of them and re-release them. Well, that's it. And so one of the other reports that, this is relatively recent, again, within the last 10 years, they found where they had multiple release of the Laricobius. 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 The Sasagi, Sasagi skimness. skimness. And then the, I think it was S-Y-C-H-M-U-S. Skimness. Skimness, which they barely found that. Skimnus coniferarum? I can't remember the species name of it. But they did a study on like, can they coexist? The biocontrols coexist in harmony? And the answer was yes, but they, they actually were able to pull out more of the Sasagi skimnus versus the Laracobius, but I don't know how many they had released prior to that. Who did this research? I will, I'll pull it out for you. As you could tell, Mark was very skeptical. But the research I was referring to was a 2016 study in the Journal of Entomological Science to determine establishment of various predators to HWA in northern Georgia. The report summarizes that 592 Sasagi skimnus suga, 232 Laracobius nigrinus, 262 Laracobius rubidus, and 58 Laracobius hybrids were recovered. Now, Sasagi skimnus suga was found at three sites three years after the release, and at two other sites two years after the release. Laracobius nigrinus was found at one site three years after release, and at two sites two years after the release. Skimnus synonodulus was never recovered. Their results demonstrate that Sasagi skimnus suga and Laracobius nigrinus are established in northern Georgia and that the native Laracobius rubidus is commonly associated with HWA and is hybridizing with Laracobius nigrinus. However, the population sizes, efficacy, and survival rates of all these predators is still unknown. I always put the research reports on the screen as well. So, no, I, I'm happy because I, I, I've started to look into this and I wanted to know the options. We couldn't get any pesticide applicators out here. That's one of the problems. Yeah. is that, you know, I've been doing outreach on adelgids for many years, and um, I don't get the interest of applicators. Uh, I try and, and help them to understand how to do this, mm -hmm. how, to, how the research on how to correctly apply the insecticides. And, and it's taken a long time, I think, to develop those techniques, primarily in the south, yeah. uh, around the Great, Great Smoky Mountain National Park. That's yeah. where actually the use of dinotefuran uh, came into play because uh, before, just using imidacloprid, uh, it would not help the bigger trees because they were already impacted mm -hmm. so greatly that they didn't have the 
basically uh, the wherewithal to get the imidacloprid up into the top of the tree. Mm. Imidacloprid is very slow to move in the tree. Dinotefuran is very fast. Right. And so basically what happens is you apply the dinotefuran at the same time as the imidacloprid in a basal bark spray to the trunk of the tree. Uh, the dinotefuran takes down the population of the, of the adelgid quickly, but it doesn't persist in the tissues very long, but the, it allows the tree time to get the imidacloprid up into the canopy. Right, and imidacloprid lasts for a much longer time it lasts, as well. Yes, it yeah. lasts for much longer. Um, that's why you know, the important thing for the homeowner to do is to, main, is to monitor their tree after they've treated it by looking up into the foliage mm -hmm. in spring mm -hmm. to see if it has those bright shoots and yeah. you know that it's working. Um, but anyway, yes, I've, I've been talking myself silly with, with applicators and some of them think they know better than the research. And one of a very interesting instance was on Skinny Atlas Lake where actually some guy came in and thought he knew better and used the product that he liked to use. And the next door neighbor used the products, the imidacloprid and dinotefuran technique. And the people that had the treatment by the guy who thought too much, mm -hmm. um, <laughs> by the guy who thought he knew everything. Yeah. There we go. Uh, <clears throat> uh, they died. Yeah. See, and I would be most interested in, because we, we always, we use this land as a tire, entire experiment, you mm -hmm. know, for us and to like, you know, just as I was showing you earlier, like putting in the Lomo native lawn, does that work? No one mm -hmm. had tried it before, you know, that kind mm -hmm. of thing. Cool. Um, and, you know, with this, I would be interested because we have a nice collection of trees here. Can I apply the Sasagi skimness? Can I apply the pesticides over there? And like, and just observe, because I, I just, I'm not getting the answers from home, homeowners that I would like to see, mm -hmm. or I would like to give homeowners a, a better solution than having to, you know, literally send out multiple emails, do multiple phone calls, go on multiple Zooms, and then not get any answers you know the part of the reason why yeah. i went with the biocontrol is because it was the it was the easiest thing i could get right now <laughs> to you know to to kind of um you know do it this year and you know and the folks that gave the last zoom conversation on hwa i think were from schuyler county so their connections hmm. are probably more in schuyler county but it's really the truth there's are there are very few people out there that yeah. have a lot of experience working with hemlock woolly adelgid but they're there yeah and they go all over the state which and... is a shame because i grew up in pennsylvania mm -hmm. and it is the state tree of pennsylvania mm -hmm. and i wonder if you could also just talk about like it's so hard to replace this tree it serves a a real it's yeah it's basically ecologically we call it a foundation species which if you simplify the the explanation it's provides the foundation a habitat foundation for the uh, for a myriad of other species of species to survive and without it you know basically uh, you won't have a lot that habitat available consider this consider uh, so you have your ash trees here they're dying when you lose ash trees in a deciduous forest, you still have a deciduous forest. Mm -hmm. If you lose hemlock in a hemlock forest, you've lost the whole game. You're going to a deciduous forest. You could try planting maybe Norway spruce to replace it, but it's not gonna be the same kind of dense canopy situation. No. It's just, it's a different habitat. And when I think about hemlocks, like this isn't a, you can't tell, but we have a lot of hemlocks like around waterways and things around as well, cooling right. the water around the brooks and the streams and things along those lines. And, you know, I have a friend who actually does shiitake farming and he does it under hemlocks. the hemlocks yeah. because of the dense shade. And it's a shade tolerant tree. Yeah, so some of these are pines, but hemlocks make much better shade than the pine. You know, it is, it yeah. persists, it grows up into in the deciduous forest, much as like yours are here. Yeah. And uh, I think that also it's important to think not of the ones that are along the streams as being important for the salmonid or the brook trout habitat for their breeding, but it's also the ones that are across the landscape because what they do, um, like at this time of year, in, early, in, in earlier spring than this, um, it, they actually maintain cooler temperatures in the ground and the, the snow persists, the ice persists under the canopy of the hemlock trees. And so it keeps the groundwater as a whole across the landscape at a lower temperature 
as it goes into the stream. So it's not just the direct shade, but it's the shade across the landscape. So if you lose a lot of the hemlocks along, along the landscape, the water temperatures will, will increase. One of the things also that I think uh, you know may sh you know should be stated, especially now that we're losing our uh, ash to emerald ash borer, is all the host-specific insects that use ash trees, or maybe That's the right. host-specific insects that we may or may not know that use the uh, our hemlocks as well. That's right. Which is really important. That's right. And you got to remember also, not everybody's going to treat every single hemlock. Mm -hmm. on the landscape, there's always going to be some out there. And that's why we find it's compatible to release the biological control with uh, the use of the insecticide because it, there'll always be those few trees that, that won't be treated and they will harbor the hemlock woolly and mm -hmm. that will allow the predator populations to build so that hopefully at some point in time we can get off the chemical treadmill. Well, one more way maybe this is off the off the topic but another potential <laughs> grad uh, grad project I had looked at the uh, research report on suga kinensis which is the Chinese suga it seems to have something that's really host specific that doesn't make it palatable as much to hemlock woolly adelgid interestingly enough so I started to dig a little bit deeper into that research, and it seems to have really um, intense, I don't know if intense is the right word, endophytic fungi that live in a microbiome that lives within the rhizosphere and on the branches and the needles of Suga canensis. And I wonder if that's something that makes it more host specific, like more um, not susceptible to hemlock woolly adelgid. You don't really find Suga canensis here because it's the Chinese one. I mean, we find the Japanese versions and all that other kind of stuff in the ornamental trade. But that was just something that kind of like stuck out to me and I was like, oh, that's interesting. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, at least in biodynamic farming and everything, there's always like spraying your, the compost tea, you know, on potential like leaves and things like that. And I wonder if there's something to that, the microbiome. Now, Suga canensis is, can't back cross, I guess, with Suga canadensis. That's correct. They're, they seem to be too... They've been able to cross it with... Caroliniensis, Carolin right? Caroliniana. Caroliniana, yeah. Right, and they've gotten that, that hybrid, but we're, you know, I, th I think that the important thing is that, is to approach this with wonder. Um, it's just an amazingly complex system. It seems very simple, but the interaction between the host tree uh, and where the host tree lives, its, its, its environment, the soils, and, and the weather about it, um, that, that, infects, that impacts the capacity of the tree uh, to, to grow and to produce secondary chemicals, and how this insect interacts with the variability just of that aspect of the tree's biology is, is huge. Mm. We don't understand it. We don't understand how the adelgid impacts the tissues directly when it feeds. We've done a lot of work. We, we know where it feeds. We know the exact cells it feeds on. But exactly what it does in those tissues, mm. we don't know. We have no idea what the basis of any kind of resistance is. Uh, I think that we're looking, we're trying to figure out if there is resistance, but we don't know. Yeah. And in order to determine that, we have to go through intense work to be sure that we're not just trying to fool ourselves, Yeah. Um, that we really have a mechanism in place. Um, and so, you know, yes, there's the possibility of all these things, Yeah. but is it gonna work here? I don't, that's, tree, I don't know. That's the. I, that's you, my wonder. You gotta be, I, I think <laughs> one. Like, I think one of the. I don't have a lab, so I, I'm just throwing it out there. Well, like, I, these are the things that me, I would love to. to I'm know. a paid skeptic. Yeah. yeah. That's my job. <laughs> it's like I read a paper like that, yeah. and I scratch my head and say, "What's their sample size? Mm -hmm. Where did they do this research? Mm -hmm. Let me see. Let me see some numbers. You know, uh, before embracing it and saying, "Oh, this." This is magic. It don't must yeah, work. don't get me wrong. I'm that's, not embracing. Okay. I'm not embracing okay. it. I'm not embracing mm -hmm. it. I am. I'm like, huh. 
that's interesting. Yes. And then I could see like, I could see, well, that makes sense because there is much more studies about the microbiome of the soils and having healthy soils, as you had mentioned in, you know, early when we got here and you see it in the agricultural fields. And I'm like, hmm, could that work? Could, you know, composting some of the Tsuga canensis in a nice spray actually work? I don't know. It could be completely off base, but the mm. idea of just thinking about possibilities it's is important. interesting. It's to important me. to think about stuff yeah. like that. Yeah. But you know, it's like if somebody gave me money to work on this thing, mm -hmm. I'd be working on the predators. Yeah, well, that's true. That's the low-hanging yeah. fruit. Yeah. We've got to do that and, first. And I think, and I think we should, and we should, because I'd love to see this roll over to uh, private homeowners you know, as well as an opportunity, you know, just to have more options and ones that are, you know, more at people's disposal. Because I think, you know, we have, and I've read reports like in four to 10 years, you know, the, the, your hemlocks might be gone and if they're infected. And that, you know, that tells me we still have time. That's right. And so, you know, I want to be able to act on it. Not a lot though. Yeah, and not a lot of time. It's like you were lucky this year to have so much mortality of the hemlock woolly adelgid. It sort of gives you a little bit of breathing room, but you got to use that wisely. Mm -hmm. I mean, because next year, I doubt it's going to be so, you're going to yeah. be so lucky. You've had a number of years of very low mortality, and we've watched the spread of the hemlock woolly adelgid throughout the state as a result of that. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's gotten up into the Adirondacks in big numbers since the low mortality over winter. Yeah. And is that, gonna, is that winter mortality gonna persist as we see climate change? I have the feeling it's not, mm -hmm. as well as the potential for the population to develop more cold tolerance. So it's sort of like we have the bre breathing time right now, and the, and the thing to do is to be smart with that time that we have. Okay. Now, due to this frustration of not being able to find designated pesticide applicators, we have a compiled list of applicators at the end of this video for New York State, so that could serve as a resource for you if you're interested in going that route. So today is a big experiment day today. Uh, it's a big expensive experiment day today. <laughs> so we're working with the Eastern Hemlocks that we have here. And as we shared, it is undergoing an infestation of hemlock woolly adelgid. And this is tragic for us because the hemlock is such a unique species of tree. And we have this little cluster actually in here, mainly around, I would say two to three dozen of our hemlocks. And most of them are actually quite young. So you could see the diameter at breast height is, is less than 12 inches. There's some that are a little greater than 12 inches, and then we have some larger ones in the back, but we're going to focus on treating these. Now, the recommendation, as was shared, is really pesticide application with neonicto uh, neonicotinoids, and that's not something that homeowners could actually apply themselves. You have to go through somebody who is designated to apply pesticides, especially that type of pesticides, onto your land. And I'm still like a little uncertain about applying pesticides onto land. So I did some research and some folks actually emailed us and told us about this biocontrol. And this is not a biocontrol that's being implemented or studied in New York, but it's actually being executed upon in Pennsylvania and Connecticut and Maine and Massachusetts. And this is Sasagi skimnus suge. So they call them STs. Now this is what some of the initial insects, they're kind of related, they're a little bit like ladybird beetles. You can see they're very, very small. And obviously trying to retrieve and find these beetles once you release them is a tall task, especially because if you have a tall tree, oftentimes the adults, so I've heard, actually go way up into the tree canopy. So if you don't have anybody crawling up into the tree canopy, sometimes the uh, rates of finding those beetles is very rare. So there is conflicting information out there about whether this is actually uh, a productive way to treat your hemlocks. We're going to go through the effort now in order to apply them 
and see if this biocontrol actually works. Now this is not a new fashion statement. This is part of the way that we're going to be adhering these onto the hemlocks. And Tree Savers, which is the organization where I got this from in Pennsylvania, has a whole handling instructions and it's really meant to be followed. It says everything like do not release in snow, rain, high wind or freezing cold. This is a perfect time to release them because it's a bright sunny day. There's no more freezing weather in the forecast and there's no rain in the upcoming forecast as, uh, um, either. And then basically you're going to want to tap them so they all kind of fall down around the lid and then you're going to open up the lid. You take this uh, ball of Excelsior material out and then you're going to close pin it to one of the leaves and eventually the beetles are going to make their way over and find any type of live or egg sacs of the woolly hemlock adelgids. The one thing about this uh, Sasagi skimness suga is that it does feast on the eggs, the egg sacs, and also the adult uh, uh, hemlock woolly adelgid, which is very unique to the other biocontrol that's out there. Uh, so we're gonna give this a shot and we're gonna go from hemlock to hemlock. We have about a thousand of these and this cost a whopping, a little, little less than $3,000 to do this. So that's why we're doing the experiment. We're gonna see if this actually works and if there's any type of efficaciousness to this. Um, and I think that it's actually worth it to try and do something with our hemlocks. The other option we could do potentially is reaching out to somebody who does apply pesticides and we could try that maybe on another small plot. But of course you wouldn't want to release these where you're releasing pesticides because those might actually affect these guys too. And uh, there is some research that is currently out there that shows that it does temporarily affect some of the calembolas and even some of the coleopterans, so the, the springtails uh, and also the beetles that are in kind of the surrounding area where you apply the pesticides. Obviously you're not like broadcasting the pesticides, you're trying to apply them as close to the tree as possible. And um, one of the other things that we're going to be doing is when it does rain, we'll be applying a nutrient drench around the uh, understory of the hemlocks and so hopefully that will also give more nutrients and we'll come out here in June and we'll see if there's actually any new growth at the tips. So we're in May right now we're not seeing any new growth at the tips quite yet but usually it's in June the month of June where you start to see new growth. If you don't see new growth at your tips then you know that your health is being compromised with your eastern hemlocks. So here here's what we're gonna do we're gonna start tapping them and every single little bug counts so we want to make sure that we get as much as possible and we just actually got these in the mail today so it was a one day in the mail from Pennsylvania to New York and I wanted to make sure that we get this you, if, if you can't use them right away then you could uh, put them in a dark place a cool dark place for 24 hours, but I would say that's about it. Let's just get this guy in there. And so here's what we're going to do. Let's see one that has hemlock woolly adelgid on it. I think this one does. So if you come up close, you could see that this one has some hemlock woolly adelgid egg sacs right there. And so what we're going to do is just pick a lower branch that we could get on here. And we're just gonna apply that on here. And again, we're gonna get every single one of these guys off. This is a little moist fabric to give them some water and moisture. I shouldn't do this with my mouth open because one might actually fall into my mouth. <laughs> okay, this one, this, there's also this little thing here. You can use your fingernail or pencil or I'm using this little pipette. I think that's, uh, you could suck them up. Yeah. I also got a little vacuum. Okay. I think that's it. There he is. Get me out. Oh, so the one, of, one of them is making it up. Oh yeah, there he goes.
Let's so. See. Oh, there's two of them now. Oh yeah. Three of them. And so. The, Four. Oh my! They're like all crawling all over the thing. The interesting thing with this is that, as one of the folks said to us, even if you had one hemlock woolly adelgid, it could just multiply continuously. And that's something that we're pretty scared of because even if it was a year where there was a lot of death of the hemlock woolly adelgid, it only really takes one. Now these are right on the egg sac. So I'm wondering, you know, what, what might actually happen. All right, so let's continue forward. This one's a big, a big tree over here. So I want to make sure that this gets some Sasagi Skimnasuga. It's a cool name to say. <laughs> and this is one of the beetles that comes from Japan. We have no analog of this beetle here. So, and again, I wish we could actually utilize some of the biocontrol that's being studied in New York, but it's only being available and released on public land because that's where the funding is coming from. It's not for private land. So it really doesn't give landowners a heck of a lot of choice. So that's why, you know, we're actually doing this really kind of expensive experiment. So if it does work, we could actually report back. I think this is a little larvae. Look at that. So they might have had little babies. So that's cool. It's really hard to see, but I'm gonna try to get it on a, well, there's a beetle right there. Oh, yeah, I got him on. Successful. All right, two down, eight to go. There is some new growth here. And you actually see here, so that's promising. So I'm just gonna get this guy on here. All right, so I applied eight of these sasajiskimnus, sasajiskimnus suge to this little hemlock grove area here. And I have two left, and I'm gonna just walk through and make sure that I have um, all of the hemlock accounted for here. But I'm, I'm gonna take a hike up to the ridge top, which goes above 1,500 feet. And surprisingly, we actually have some hemlocks up on that ridge top. Typically, you'd see them in the bottomlands, like near the ravines and everything. But we do have some hemlock up there, and I took a, a trip up there maybe like in the winter months and there was some hemlock woolly adelgid up there so I'd like to get it actually deeper into the forest and I feel like this area is really well covered. Thanks for watching this video and we hope that it gave you a lot of invaluable information on the hemlock woolly adelgid. If you like what we're doing here at Flock consider liking, subscribing, and hitting the notifications button and even tipping. If you're in New York State and looking for applicators that are trained to treat trees for hemlock woolly adelgid, we have a free download on our website. Just head over to flockfingerlakes.com, navigate to learn in the menu, and you'll find it there. We give back 10% of our Google AdSense proceeds back into the community here in the Finger Lakes, and that's matched by our partners over at Espoma Organic. So your support matters no matter where you're watching. Thank you, and we'll see you in the next video.